I loved college, and then it was the second in my family to go to university. My husband being the first. Coincidentally, we both went to high schools just down the road in Hope Street, and he lived in Hope Street. I went to the Girls Institute, and 10 years previously, he went to the Boys Institute. The Girls Institute now is a women's technology college, and the Boys Institute is Lithar, uh, founded by Paul McGarden. I loved studying in college. I studied, and then I went to study politics at uh, London Poly. I was at the Poltash protests. I was at the free Nelson Mandela concerts. I was broke or full of hope. And the very same college that I studied my A-levels at became the main employer for me as a teacher. The very same A-level lecturers became my colleagues and uh, UCU comrades. And I stayed working there for three whole decades. So 30 odd years later, I'm now on the outside of the place. Uh, splendidly cool by lots of people on the outside around the outsiders. So I spend my time politically active and pretty much a similar amount of time with trade union duties and the FE rep for the NEC for year. But my talk tonight is centred on a selection of incidents or events um, over the last 30 years, mostly for the former of those years. Uh, and I've been reflecting on them for some time. So these are like memorable incidents or events that have shaped what I now think to be the most significant aspect of that career. But to try to give you a bit of structure, and I was just saying before to Alice about trying not to be too much into a structure, and about being a teacher, you have to structure stuff. Um, I've settled on three metaphorical sort of phases to help, to help you. So the first phase is that of divorce, and that's the current phase. Uh, dismissal from college after 30 years, I'm linking to a divorce. It's, it's deeply conflicting, it's personally tragic, it's fatalistic. But there's definitely no turn back. Second metaphorical phase is that of marriage. 
uh, being a teacher or aka being in a marriage with its ups and downs, with an overwhelming commitment to try to be together, staying in rather than getting out, working at it, taking one for the team, so to speak, but maybe compromising that some individual cost. The third is that of courting, learning to teach, aka courting, chasing the passion, completely immersed within it, driven, with some keeping out of, uh, sorry, some reaching out to support when almost giving up, but still blind to the perils that lay ahead. So what brought me here tonight? So directly, colleague Joel Petrie told me about the Rackage University via Trent and Productions, and thank you to him for introducing me to that and for giving me the opportunity, Alex, to be here. But indirectly was a sort of concept of writing tools that I've already previously been introduced to, this idea of what Alex talked about, learning from each other in informal spaces. It was uh, an organisation called the Frosty and Puffs, second mention to my dad, <laughs> who was the founder and mentor of that and of film. Um, tenderly abbreviated to PIPs. And both of them are about that learning outside of formal infrastructures, like college. And also maybe the cosmos brought me here, who knows. So in short, I'm still here post-college, talking to you about the ups and downs of my experiences in fair education. So three of the books. First up, which felt like real fair education, or a real fair education service, was that of teaching in adult education and community learning. And these, this was a massive department in college when I started. At the beginning of my teaching career, even though it was 1992 and it was post-incorporation, there was still the infrastructure and the closest relationship that I ever can recognise to what was a real education and a real fair education service. So if you think back to those times, that was post Thatcher, John Major government. Basically, the infrastructure is intact. The courses and lessons allowed for mostly an individualised approach. There was a real range of interest in taste courses and introductory courses, social sciences, creative courses, interest courses, dare we say hobbies. They were around though, the principles of second chance to learn and what we now know of as lifelong learn. But it was pretty much about relationship building, team building, it was sociable, at times political. Plenty of opportunities to discuss and debate. Second up, later in the middle of my career, uh, being a teacher activist, using the union structures to try to campaign and affect the workplace. On reflection, my activism coincided with cuts to the service. And third up, formerly the high of simply sharing our practice, teachers working together, willing to object to reject, to revise the moronic, the banal, or simply to have something inaccurate changed. Latterly, it was such a joy to be working alongside teacher educators, and that was linked to teacher education courses at the University of Huddersfield. Um, but that sort of collectivism and sharing was still there, albeit within higher education. Three of the downs. The downer of the dismantling of all of the above. The downer of having no meaningful time to do anything consistently well. And lastly, the downer of work, 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 and treacherous workload. Okay, so a quick note on 
reflection or reflecting three points. So as a teacher, all the way through teaching career, it was about efforts to try to reflect. Uh, pretty much that followed me all the way through during my set ed, uh, through the momentary professional body for the Institute for Learning, uh, and then as a teacher educator. But what I found the most effective way of reflecting was during teaching and during the lesson. Uh, on Alex's website, I posted, or Alex posted a, a journal that really struck with me. Uh, in the last year, if I can call it from reflexivity. So it's not about reflecting after, it's reflecting during. It's mainly about the help services, but the point is about being able to respond when you're in the moment. So for those of you that are interested, that journal will probably be there. And if I was reflecting after the lesson, for me to be reflecting effectively was with people. And it's very funny. And if I was reflecting alone, I found it better to take into the context of teaching. And that's where I was inspired by two guys called Food and Walker. And they understood how limiting reflection was for teachers in improving practice. Whereas uh, I'm to go to that and talk about context, reflect on how you're doing it, where you're doing it, when you're doing it. So trying to, to work and reflect in a way that was expected of us, uh, confession number one, was pretty minimal. In fact, it was utterly neglected. But now, with these reflective theories in my pocket, I hope tonight's reflections offer some food for us on some of the ups and downs and go somewhere to inform how fair education or the fair education service has changed. So for the format, I've selected a range of incidents. Um, and when I was invited to do this, there was a long list of incidents. And depending on who was turning off, I was like going to check off those incidents. <laughs> but some of the people that might be interested in this event might have said these things to me. Um, the incidents I tried to reflect on, given some of the theories I've mentioned, um, and I've, I've got rid of a few for this again. But then trying to pen portrait or identify what was memorable about something. And I'm not teaching now, but they formed what I consider to be my view of what was worthwhile about that experience of working for 30 years within college. In another way, we call them critical events. So the inspiration for this format actually is not mine. It was a student who, who was invited to speak about how fair education had transformed their life. And it was an event we put on, uh, UCU put on, when the first punts hit adult education in the college. And it was a campaign that Moya will now will save our unfair education or ensure safe. And we'd hired Philharmonic Hall Music Room for a public campaign meeting. And the best speech that I remember was the students on the panel. And she basically described their entering fair education on takes to courses while the kids were at home, right up to going to university. And so I'm pinching her way of doing things. So the reflections. We'll see how far we go. This one's called Curriculum Team Planning. And it was at the Friday meeting. And it spanned two decades. So it's the whole of the 1990s and uh, thereafter. Who was there? Teachers, teams of teachers. But principally, I talked about the community learning team. And what was it there for? It was there to collaborate. And we were informing the planning. So those of you who've taught might think, that's not new, but it's not there now. And where this took place in various college sites, two notable sites are no longer there. One is in North Liverpool, which was not sold, the high to visit, but is now a set of apartments, and another college site on the east side of the hill, 
So I've got this now an hour of supermarket. But specifically, we have a long discussion. This Friday meeting could go on as long as we have the best feeling. We rolled out of that meeting after hours of discussing what was the word that we needed. And what that word was, was the difference between successfully or independently. And we struggled, but we persevered. And the point was, what word actually uh, means what we wanted to mean. And this is a group of English teachers showing what they did or what they preached they could do in practice. So what we were doing in this Friday meeting exactly what we were doing in the classroom, just persevering under the words that we chose, that meaning to us, without meaning to the students, and without meaning to the warm bodies. So again, as teachers or students, you might think, no surprise there, but it is a surprise because now you don't persevere over the right word. You get told what words you're going to use by warm bodies. But we would discuss and we would debate and we would examine until we arrived at the right word. And it took time. But the teachers decided and the teachers agreed. And of course, this was at a time when important bodies were led by teachers. So there's no minor thing deciding on the words. It was a living embodiment of what community led and knowledge were about. After all, we were English teachers. So we were studying the language. The second one's called Macbeth and Fiction. It's the 1990s. These were three courses, and this one is a GCSE English literature course. We studied in the kitchen of a school in Boston, which was called a parent school partnership. We were in the kitchen because it was an outbuilding for staff. What they did is they read Macbeth, not a speech, not a chapter, the whole book. We read the whole book out loud. We read the whole book together and they studied together. together. They were turning up six hours a week. Now it would be three and a half hours of your people. And they studied that book and understood that book. They don't say. Next one's called Save the NHS. This was in a college called Child Wooden College. The venue no longer exists. It is now a staff car park for the women's hospital. I taught GCSE in those language. Adults on top step studying and access to my course. It was full time. And what I made my full time was most of the week and most of the day. And it paid the type of bursary to the students studying on that course. On my course, students had to give a full 20 minute presentation on a topic of their choice. This one student did a presentation on the beauty of the NHS. The student now campaigns to protect the women's hospital and is active in Save the NHS. I see her all the time. She's a community activist. She does this because she was supported in complete and access for it. This next one's called Real Support. This is about the educational maintenance allowance and study boxes. This was in the college in the 2000s. This was for young people aged 16 to 18. The aim was for them to be financially supported to attend college and to help them organise their studies. It was an incentive, I suppose, for them to attend, but more than not, they wouldn't have gone to college if it wasn't the EMA. They received about £30 a week based on their attendance. The study boxes were extraordinary things. They understood that students from working class backgrounds had nowhere to put their, their studies. The 
sponsors around this big asset boxes, full of stationery, files, papers, pens. It seems like a dream now that we think that students really gave them boxes to take home to help organise their studies, as well as their demand that we could attend the college. It's not that long ago. The next set of reflections or incidents are like smaller ones, like in a red list. So bear with me on these. I spent a long time of my career where I think in centres or flimsy books out in the crib, out in community areas. There was one in every single region of the world. They're called uh, Liverpool Still Centres, unfortunately. There's about 10 of them at the height and 20 in here to the main sites. They were only abandoned in 2014. This one's called Putting in an Extra Shift. This is the morning shift. This is a student who I call the baker. He would come straight from a night shift from over the water in the middle before heading home to get some kick. And then we go up to do the school pickup by the swipe is that way. Told me I want to be able to read with my son and not come into home work. That is a vivid memory that I've been reflecting on. On the ability for somebody to be able to go from work, full-time work, straight into a drop-in student centre, learn, go and get some kick. And still get out there by three o'clock to pick up his kid. It's all because it couldn't be easy. There's other vivid memories I've got, but less reflected on. Things like I want to be able to write my own Christmas cards. Another one, I want to write a letter to my cousin in Australia. Generally, I want to have a better job. These drop-in study centres went on for 15 years. Not one exists now. This is a bit of a happier one. This is the VP in the World Cup 2010. It was the summer time. It was hot. We were all sitting, working away on the computers. It was about 12 members of staff. The VP came into the office. Called us over to a neighbouring classroom, put that on agenda. And if we wanted to, we can catch a world well come together. We wanted to, and so we did. The last one I've left just in case I'm seeing it and he's not. <laughs> so this one's called Not On My Watch. This is a saying from a college leader, and it meant Absolutely no compulsory redundant policies while he was a college leader. This was also an era of celebrations of learning. And we got stuck once in a corridor, not knowing how to get out of the venue, giggling how ridiculous we were, not being able to work at the fire escape. This was a time when the community venues were able to celebrate everything they achieved every year and choose which venue they did it in. I'm going to tell you about one such venue. The students that decided where it be. It was in Miller's Peak, the site of the film. It was in a function club at the back of a pub. They had a buffet, a DJ. Three senior leaders turned up that night to celebrate the, the um, Another, not long after, was a rainy, windy night home across the country park was hired. And again, three senior leaders were there celebrating the learning. All areas of the college at that time were deemed outstanding and graded as such by a step. All these community books, all these places where there were taste courses and other qualifications, where young people would study alongside their elders, no longer exist. I think that's enough. I've got two more pages. But I think what I'm going to end on is that there was a high, there were many ups, 
We, we welcome questions, but we decided we'd wait till the end. Um, okay, hello, I'm Joel, Joel Petri. Um, I've got a, I've got a lengthy thing here, which I'm probably going to ignore, I think. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you about the most important person in the room, first of all. And then I'm going to tell you an anecdote. One or two of you have heard the anecdotes. But like all the narratives, they shift and change, so... I think um, it's, a, it's a story that, it's a story that, that merits being told twice. The most important person in the room, though, is Nina Duran, who for many years has been uh, at the cutting edge of trade unionism in, in what used to be in happier days at Liverpool Community College, and is now at sadly the city of Liverpool College. And like almost every other significant trade unionist in the last 10 years has been shafted by the extremely aggressive neoliberal revolting current management. So I was very, very pleased to invite Nina to come speak tonight and I'm very much hopeful that things might work out well in the weeks and months. So the anecdotes I think links in with Nina's theme how, how the college did most of us, many, many of us have used to work for shifted from being a resource for community into being some weird hybrid business entrepreneurial horror show. Um, so not long after the, the current principal of the, the college took over, uh, they, they announced that they announced by a three-line clip that we had to have a meeting, all staff, academic staff support staff, all staff. And there was nowhere within the college big enough have this meeting, so they hired a Philharmonic Hall just down the road. And those of you who have been to the Philharmonic Hall may, may, may occasionally have seen a film there, they show particularly classic black and white films every Christmas since the show It's Wonderful Life. And this, this, this screen comes out of the floor, and it's enormous, it's an enormous screen. And it really is big, so it's a really big screen. Um, and this little guy appears from the stage right, a short, fast Scottish guy in a kilt, very thick glasses, and he, and he comes wandering on. And this Wurlitzer organ comes out the floor, and he sits at this organ and starts playing like deeply cheesy black pool time. And he chews, and he does this. <laughs> He's happy as a pig and shit, as a pig and shit, this guy. So, he wasn't, he wasn't there on this occasion, but the screen was, the screen came up. So we were all sitting there, and the lights went down. So there's several hundred, several hundred academics, sports staff, air, air taking staff, everybody in, this, in the building, in the Philharmonic. And the lights went down, and the lights went up on the stage, and the senior leadership team processed onto the, onto, with their seats in front of this fucking huge screen. So we're down here in the dock, and they're up there in the light. And that encapsulates one of the things that is now fundamentally wrong with further education. So, um, so this PowerPoint presentation comes up, and, and as, as, as I've tried to stress, it's a big screen. A PowerPoint presentation at that scale is quite an overwhelming Orwellian experience. So, so, so the principal went through her, her vision and blah blah blah. How, how we were going to get rid of we were going to get rid of community and of ownership and not all this stuff. So the, the general disgruntlement in the, in the crowd simmering. And then she puts up this 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 story of a of a of a gazelle being savaged by a cheetah, which was linked in with uh, some of you will remember the this thing called the gazelle group. Which is colleges which have a particular emphasis on entrepreneurialism. 
So she put this slide and she said, this illustrates how we as a college need to be more fleet of foot. And I'm thinking, that fucking gazelle's not very fleet of foot, it's going down. And so, so gazelle, etc. Anyway, she, she, she would have to look around the building that we were supposed to be doing. And at the end of the presentation, she said, so colleagues, I, I kid you not, this is exactly what she said. This is no exaggeration. She said, so colleagues, what we all need to be aware of is from this day forward, today is year zero. And I'm sitting next to Gerwin Evans, who's a long time in trade unionist, what is that? And he said, Christ, first of all, they introduced the iconography of national socialism, and now it's the rhetoric of Paul and Halloween. I'm going to pull. So, um, and it didn't get much better after that. The whole situation in the college. So that's my anecdote. So, uh, at about the same time, I was working in teacher education, as, 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 as did Nina, before she was shunted stage left, as did Moyo. And I was doing some of the graduate study, um, and I kept on coming across the, these references to the Cinderella sector from everywhere. In fact, today, the, the, new, the new skills minister, today, the new skills minister on the, 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 the Egypt when I was part of the country, uh, did this big speech in which she said the further education sector will not be the Cinderella sector anymore. And I'm like, I thought we'd thought we sorted this out, boy. I thought, I thought nobody was using that in flat anymore. I could tell you lots of stuff about the Cinderella sector. I'm not inclined to really. Um, reading the room, I think we've had a lovely evening. And the band was amazing. I'm very pleased about the band. And I'm delighted that Nina had a chance to articulate some of the visions around. Uh, I will just finish, if I may, by uh, reading a, a few lines, which, which are the last lines in the introduction to Further Education in the 12th Anti Principles, which is the book that Moya and I were to with Professor Kevin Moore, and was, was our kind of utopian space, I guess, to some extent, it was a reaction to the, the horror of the college that's in my being taken over by these absolute Nazis. I don't mind them being Nazis. What 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 objective is that? Can't be Nazis? Like at least the Nazis would build fucking roads from it. These these people don't even know what they're doing. They're absolute idiots. It's like Allo Allo. It's like it's like further education is like Allo Allo working in our place. This can be recorded. Yes. Don't show it to anybody. I'm already in trouble. So can FDE live happily ever after? If the sector is to be grim, it should be so on our own terms as powerful democratic dancing professionals. And I didn't warn Moyo that if this went terribly wrong, I was going to insist that you came for some chat 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 with me. Warner, Marina Warner, who's a really interesting, really interesting academic who writes about fairy tales, argues that fairy tales can act as different columnists, defining existing structures while proposing alternatives. They offer magical metamorphoses. To one word in the door. The faculty of wonder, my curiosity, can make things happen. It is time for wishful thinking to have its due, not for one minute to four. So, this, so, so on to our closing statement, really. Um, this really was a good sentence for this book and the two which followed. It says, It is time for the sector of dancing principles to have its due, and for Ethelie Cinders to be reunited. I don't, I don't have any questions. Anybody has a question? Sure. Um, the anecdote that you provided was very interesting, but slightly inaccurate. Oh, well, I'm not surprised, okay. the, the person who introduced the Gazelle meme, and this is why the college is what it is now, was a consultant yeah, brought into the college, and her background 
was establishing an online gambling company with venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. That was the kind of thing she did. She came on the stage and she said, look at this. Does this deserve government being satisfied with the chief? And she said, if you don't want jam, I'm smoking and it was absolutely quite like they were in a whole bunch of us within a year or so, you know. But the whole section of the not 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 a question, but an useful clarification. I mean. Uh, I remember, I remember that one. She was, she was. But the question is, like, like me, Frank, I'm a, I'm a graduate of English for Edinburgh. And I, 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 I don't believe you should let veracity get in the way of the stories. Mick? Right. We're all probably very anticipating me with the not the right knowledge, just a long before being a function of that. I mean, that sort of thing is exactly the way that you're When you start, when we start, in the over there, we work in Oxford, some of the great people, some of the people in that area. We still have any residual elements of that. We just love it. 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 And the second one is to do that big thing to step. And it's interesting that the first one is kind of what we have to ask that. The coincidence seems to be currently she took this first 13,000 pounds of community education to reclaim the battle to grow whatever weight it is. Not going to be any difference. It was taking decades to get to where it was. It's taking your people from the actual, not just their uh, local authority. Well, um, so not like that. But I do think the, the message is to not rest on the laurels, which we did. I only became in the union and points and points and points of the crisis until um, 15 years ago. And second issue, that's why being a teacher activist is the most important part of my career. It's that way, you know, we're going to go on my incidents with one job and that to be removal of Friday meetings, debating words and discussing decisions that all the planning to instead these gross, hideous performances have. First of all, the same job as well. Secondly, it was the Telemonitor, uh, where we were anonymous. Our teachers were anonymous. I don't think we were proud. Um, so, 
the new of uh, plants shop jacket and a set of uh, high quality stones. Yes and no. We I'm going to leave it open. I'm going to turn it off to Mr. Nick. I think you can get something like a balcony that comes in and this manifold thing is incredibly quickly. I think, I, think, I, think, I think there are alternative universes in which somebody comes in with a better vision, 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 even within the very difficult context of FE, which is massively underfunded, which is another issue you know, as well. But even within a massively underfunded thing, you, 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 can, have, you can have leadership which, which is much more in tune with the sorts of values that we're expressing. Um, I, I, I'm personally quite friendly now in terms of the principles who, you know, the principles, they, 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 they do what they have to do, they do what's, what, it's, what, what it says on the tin. But they operate in a far more humane, politically savvy way than the current leadership of the economy. One of the things that makes those of us who've worked on the, on the grand regime in Kent's College have to, have to be conscious of is that it was an extreme regime. I mean, I mean there are all kinds of problematic leadership behaviors across, across the federal education sector, but we got the fucking doozy. We, we, we got somebody who's absolutely off their fucking head, basically. She's a street fighter, she's a cheap one. So I, so, so I have a degree of optimism that in, in different, in different contexts, for different individuals. So part of the problem, the problem, the problem is that we're, we're, we're subject to those individuals. And one, of, one of the problems with further education now is that, unlike historically, when at least there was some oversight from local educational authorities, from local councils, uh, and, and, and lecturers could potentially, trade unions could potentially go and speak to local councils and say there is a problem with X, Y, Z, there's a problem with our community provision, there's a problem with how much money is being invested into ESOL or whatever. That's all gone because they, they operate now as personal fiefdoms. So you only have to get a lunatic in charge for it to be really problematic. But I, I, I'd like to think in 10 years' time, when the current regime has gone through retirement and attrition, that things will be better. You can charge them. But, I, but is, it, is, that, is that something to do with the old baleful influence on those three institutions? Okay, but I have people that work in a number of colleges around the country that I'm, that I'm close to, and the frustrations and difficulties they're experiencing, which are set to wide, do not compare to the aggressive managerialism that people have been experiencing in, in Colt. It's, it's just not the same. It's just not. These colleges are not sacking all of their trade unions. That's 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 that's, that's qualitatively different. The ideology and whatever is federal government and how that mentality of anti-union is well with us in the Yes, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. 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 
come from the back and say, do you know what? Do you remember? Like this could be allowed. You talk about further education in the Conservative Party. You can't pull them back and say, remember what it was like in the 1980s, 1990s, and They don't understand it. And that's what I think we're working against is that yeah. idea that you can't pull them back because they don't fucking know. And they never know. And they've ended up because that's part of the and education. It's not about profit. It's about profit. It's about profit. And that's true for five-year-olds to unfortunately, that's ridiculous. Right, we aim, we aim to finish at 9.30. Is that for the last question? Or are we, are we, are we good? Are we done? Quickly. To ask you, how does it feel doing the pub? It's nice doing the pub. I particularly enjoyed the live music. You know, that, that was, that was, that was, I'm pleased we did that. Thank you very much. It was mainly the Yeah. We're thinking about doing another one new year. But, you know, the way these contacts about the same good rules. We just go out and shout and do things, but we enjoy it. Okay, colleagues, thank you very much. Don't forget. Okay. One last thing. One last thing. Your own presentations. Uh, my name is Hugh, but I just wanted to say something because um, we're all talking about how it feels a bit hopeless and stuff. And I went to college in the 90s, and so I saw how the end was of the group of the area, and I suppose it was towards the end. But I just want to say two things, because there were two things. So I started teaching colleges. Um, I did the qualification of music, I went to live and did music there and all that stuff. And then I decided the last teaching college, I remembered how good it felt. It was a Friday night, we'd go for a pint with the lecturers. It was like one of the things. And one of the lecturers gave me the first job. He took me to Switzerland when I was 18. He made me a roadie at a jazz festival. I had my first joint there and I was in the main time. Easy. Easy. We're making a good one. That doesn't happen. Right. Um, I understand. My dear employer, very well. Um, so, for one, it was much later when I started to teach at uh, Liverpool Community College. I was taught in the last year of Liverpool Community College. I was a girl by um, Fiona Bagger. So, um, what happened was, I started doing my teacher qualification and why I was my teacher. And one of the first lessons, she made us stare at a painting for about two minutes and not speak. And it blew my fucking head off. It was, a, it was an amazing experience. I remember when she interviewed me to do it. Were you smoking pot? No, I wasn't. I didn't it. And um, I just realised that people who were there and had a deeper history with further education knew exactly what it should be about. And um, it just set a lot of us up. We were trying to keep fighting. Um, there was another thing that happened, which I think I was responsible for as well. Because Elaine Bam not long took over, and she set up this um, curriculum and quality corporate event. And I think that Moyer invited Frank Caulfield, uh, or someone, maybe like Might have been me, I and they didn't know who he was, and he just, he just. Uh, but went to them to the face for about half an hour so they were teaching kids how to be academic polemics and it was completely useless and uh, Effie was about second chance and everything they were doing was a complete bag of shit and pointless and wouldn't achieve any educational outcomes and I was like you're cool so and then I was like I was, I was getting to union culture and that kind of stuff I remember one of my very earliest meetings and I, I just volunteered as a rep. And then, like, this woman sat next to me who didn't know. 
And then she got up, and then she just basically told everyone what the fuck was what about how they need to be focused and making sure that we still stood for the community. And that was Nina. And so three of those people were really formative, not only for me, but for loads of people starting in education at that time. And now we kind of we've been in the game for about ten years. And now we're on a, now we're reps and now we're on secretaries. We're not taking any of that shit. And the, the good thing about these leaders, the best thing about them is that they're completely vain and they've got really weak egos. And what happens is you kind of you start to try to learn how to negotiate with emperors, if you know what I mean. And um, they've got nothing absolute to stand on when they talk about quality of education, when they talk about what finances make sense, when they talk about giving you zero percent and saying it's fair and then giving themselves 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent. So there is hope and uh, it will come back around, I guarantee you. I was thinking about the shoes.